What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're going to be talking about Detroit Lions defensive lineman Michael Brockers as he spoke on Dan Campbell, compared him to Sean McVay, and also possibly gave us a little insight that a turnaround could be in the cards for the Detroit Lions. So let's get it started. We're going to bite a kneecap off, and we're going to stand up, and then it's going to take two more shots to knock us down. And on the way up, we're going to take your other kneecap, and we're going to get up, and then it's going to take three shots to get us down. And when we do, we're going to take another hunk out of you. Before, before long, we're going to be the last one standing. Welcome, everybody, to another video. Glad you guys are here. And I am talking a little bit quieter today. My voice kind of hurts when I try to talk loud. So I'm going to try to keep it on the down low. I still got the energy. I got the fire for this video. I'm just not going to be talking as loud. But I am excited because this is a very exciting video. I said, hey, we have to do this. All right, I got other video ideas. I've been jotting some stuff down. I actually had other things planned to do first. But I was like, we got to talk about this and what Michael Brocker said about Dan Campbell and this Lions organization on the gym Rome show because I think what he said is just a, it's just some really cool stuff and I actually dove into it much deeper than I probably should have I talked about this a little bit yesterday on other shows but I really dove into this all really up late last night and so far today and I have some things that I want to show you but I first want to start off by going through what Michael Brocker said about the Detroit Lions and when he was talking about Dan Campbell when he was talking about the potential to turn around this team because remember Michael Brockers was a part of that Jeff Fisher team that in 2016 went 4-12, and 0-7 oh when Jared Goff was there. That was his rookie season. It was kind of a mess. It wasn't as toxic, I would say, as you know maybe the Lions kind of were recently, but it wasn't great. It's never great when you're losing games. Things can get kind of ugly, but then Sean McVay came in, and everything changed. I mean, the offense went from terrible to great. They go 11-5 and that season. Jared Goff is outstanding. He makes a Pro Bowl in 2017, which, again, I don't care too much about the Pro Bowl, but he was really good that season, and the defense was good. They had some coaching staff changes, but they went from 4-12 and 12 to a playoff spot. And look, there's turnarounds every year. Every year there's turnarounds in the NFL. Usually every year there's one team that goes from worst to first. So you can find tons of examples on this. But since Michael Brockers compared it to the Detroit Lions, and I think there are some very legitimate similarities. Now, not exactly because every team needs different things. But there are some similarities in terms of the way the Lions have built their team this offseason and how the Rams kind of did it. Plus, we have guys with connections there. Not only Michael Brockers, but also Jared Goff. That's a big one. Brad Holmes. Holmes, Aubrey Pleasant, that were a part of that turnaround as well, now playing with the Detroit Lions. And Michael Brockers kind of said that he was a little bit of a, trying to be a little bit of a leader for this team. Same thing with Jared Goff, like going forward with this team and trying to lead this to a turnaround. So I want to break it up into a couple segments, uh, have you guys listen to some clips that Michael Brockers said if you have not seen the interview. And then at the end, we're going to kind of dive into some extra stuff that I just probably shouldn't have done, but I did uh, at the end. All right, so a couple of clips. The first clip is really where he starts talking about Dan Campbell and he compares him to Sean McVay a little bit. Uh, and remember, Michael Brockers was a very big move for the Detroit Lions this offseason. They traded for Brockers uh, and then they gave him that deal for three years, $24 million. It was a pretty big deal. The Lions didn't make a whole bunch of big deals this offseason, but that was one of the bigger ones. They actually got him for like relatively nothing from the LA Rams. And I've actually stated this offseason, I'm going to stick with it, that defensively in terms of personnel, this is the biggest addition for the Detroit Lions. Lions. I just think what he brings, not only as a leader saying things like this, helping pull the team together to try to turn around, but also what he brings on the field. I mean, he is a fantastic run defender. The Lions are trying to be a better run defensive team this season because last year was not. Uh, I think Michael Brockers brings a lot to the table here. But let's dive into this first clip. I'll let you guys listen and then we'll discuss. I mean, working with him is awesome because he, he, he reminds me a lot of, of McVay and how he came in as far as like, Understanding that man, it's, it's no ego when it comes to to his coaching style. It's all about, um, you know, the team. It's all about. Um, I don't want to use a statement from the Rams, but like it's a it's a we we not me mentality. Um, but you know, it's, it's all about the team. It's all about what we can do to to be better. What we can do um, to win more games. What we can do. So I like that aspect about his coaching is not oh I'm coming in here and I'm changing the team. It's more about. He, yeah, he does. He is coming in here. He's, you know, a new coach and he has a lot of expectations. But at the same time, he, he's expecting us as men to, to do our part. And I think that's what we love and what we respect about him. He likes the staff. He said it's awesome. He said the team is great. That's good stuff to hear. But the big part of this first segment was when he said there is no ego. Like Sean McVay, Dan Campbell is coming in with no ego here. And the way he describes that is basically it's all about the team. It's a we, not me mentality. He's saying, hey, I got to go get my guys. He said, no. You are my guys. Like, my guys are right here. I'll go get help. You know, we'll bring in players that we think will help us. 
But you guys are our guys as of right now. And we're going to try to put you in the best spot to be successful. And we'll get into that. But it's not me versus everybody else. Not me versus the Packers. It's us versus the Packers. A lot of situations get ugly in the NFL, right? We've seen it back with Jacksonville when things got ugly. And then they turned it around. Mark Brunell told us about that. You know, when things get divided. They're not, everybody's not unified. Even our last regime was kind of ugly, right? You got players like, oh, I don't want to be here. I want out. What happened with Jacksonville with the front office between the players? Tom Coughlin. Everybody won out. I'm not signing the deal. I'm not coming back. Things were going so well, but winning can't hide everything. Winning hides a lot, but especially when losing starts, oh, now things get messy or happy. So you got to find a way to keep everybody unified. And think about our leaders on this. What Michael Brocker said, Jared Goff. Michael Brocker said, hey, when I got here, remember the comment he made about Jared Goff? And he was like, oh, that's not good. He's like, I called Jared Goff and I was like, hey, mean anything by that? Let's go lead this team. You know, basically, like, let's lead this team to a turnaround. We got to put that behind us because if we have issues like this, this early, things are going to get messy real quick and we can't have that. Not as the leaders. We are supposed to lead this group. We've been here. We're familiar with some of these guys. We have to go lead this group by example. All right. So we can't have this stuff. And the players are already taking that aspect. They're taking that approach. Things will get separated. Players will fight. We was a fight in the Jacksonville practice because things were getting that out of hand. All right. That's a problem. And that's because it starts from the front office and it works this way down to the locker room. But when the front office is on check, everybody's working together. Things can click as a unit and turnarounds happen because players buy in. It doesn't mean you're going to be great. You still need the other things. You need the talent. You need this. You need that. But still, that's how you start. You're, you're, things aren't going to last. You can have spikes with great players. But it ain't going to last. You're not going to find consistency within an organization if players aren't consistently buying in. That's always true is that players will come and players will go. Where you draft them, you trade for them, you sign for them, it just happens. You can't keep everybody. Well done college organization. They recruit at a high level. Players stay. They want to be there and they keep doing it. Always going to have the best draft picks. You're always going to find all the talent for you. You're always going to have the most money. All right, you may make some dumb decisions, but you got to find a way to find consistent success. Really, this entire Lions staff has done this offseason. They didn't come in with the mindset that I got to blow everything up. I got to fire everybody that was here. I got to get rid of all of these players because you don't fit. We're running my defense and you're going to be forced to fit into it. If it don't work, it don't work. But that's what's going to happen this offseason. That's not at all the approach the Lions have taken. And it's not even just personnel. It's really across the board. I would start off with Brad Holmes first. Brad Holmes, new general manager, right? He comes in and usually they change the front office. And yeah, he had his additions. He had his John Dorsey's, right? Some big additions there, you know, Ray Agnews. But he also, at the same time, didn't come in and say, hey, I'm firing all you guys, okay? You guys are going to have to find someone else because this is a regime change. He kept guys that were here from the past regimes with Bob Quinn's, guys that were here and promoted under Bob Quinn. He said, look, I didn't know a lot of these guys, but I always felt like I had to give them an opportunity because guys always give me an opportunity. And that's something we've talked about in the past, but that's where it starts. It starts up top, and he really set the example there. But then on, in terms of the staff, right, you got a lot of new staff coming in. You kept some guys around like Hank Fraley right? The tight ends coach. But then in terms of personnel, you didn't come in and blow up the roster, say, you don't fit, you don't fit, you know, we're going to cut all these guys. They instead came in and said, okay, we're going to adjust our basically scheme to the players that we have. We're not going to force you into spots. We think you're best here. This is what we're going to put you on the field. And they did that going to the four, three, two gap, even though it is the background, maybe two gap, maybe one gap. We'll see. Even though it is the background of a guy like Aaron Glenn, who's now running the defense, but a guy like Todd Walsh, right? He was in a 4-3 defense. The lines are adjusting, moving guys to positions that they feel like they're going to be the best, not forcing guys in the spot. Offensively, a big one. You know, Anthony Lynn working with Jared Goff, having him have a big say in putting together this team, how they're building this. I think that's huge. And he said, I felt empowered by this. I'm happy to be with a team that wants me here. You know, Brad Holmes wants me. Brad Holmes knows what this guy needs to be successful there's a guy that knows it's brad holmes all right hey that almost rhymed that was close next clips that i want to show you michael rockers talks about the staff and how many players there are but he also brings up a very important part and probably the most important part and probably the biggest thing that we lacked last season and that's communication all right so here we go this perspective and a lot of coaches on our staff and this is the first time i've been a part of a staff that has seven to eight maybe double digit coaches um on our staff that has played in the league and has played for a long time you know so um, when you when you have that and you have that understanding that they have they have an understanding of, of what we go through as players so they understand that it's going to be tough it's a it's a grind you know it's the season um, is 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 a, is a marathon it's not a sprint you know and communication uh, like you said earlier is very is vital and the the way you communicate is vital because a lot of guys don't want to be um, you know yelled at or screamed at or stuff like that man some people just want you to just Talk to him as a man, gain an understanding of what you're talking to, talking about and what you're trying to teach, and then let's roll. I mean, a lot of 
uh, of these players in the league. You know, we aren't we aren't about a lot of BS, man. Just tell us what we got to do. Explain it to us in in terms that we understand, and let's 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 get the job done. As you can see, he talks about the staff saying, "Hey, this might be the first staff I'm a part of with possibly double digit, you know, former players. They played in the NFL, they played at the highest level, and uh, not only is that great because you know if we played any team in a football game, like if we had to if we had to get our coaches out there play flag football, our team's winning. All right, the Lions are going undefeated. In that no no team can handle that. We got way too many former players. Let's have coaches that understand what the players are going through, really to another level, not just as a coaching experience, but also being in your shoes." being that player uh, playing in your spot. I think that's huge. And Lions have done that in a lot of different spots. Outside linebacker, Kelvin Shepard, right? Our quarterback coach, Mark Rennell, Antoine Randall L. You can go across the board. Todd Walsh played defense line. He didn't really play a lot in the NFL. Aubrey Pleasant, Aaron Glenn. I mean, it's all of Dan Campbell, right? He was a tight end for the Lions. Uh, so all these guys do Staley. All of these coaches, they're coming in and they have that experience they played before. And I haven't heard anything bad about it in terms of players, and you probably won't. But we have heard some good things here in terms of players signing here saying, hey, that's the reason that I came here. I like the fact that they had all these former players on the staff because I think they do understand. They understand what you're going through injuries. They understand you know, how to get you in a rhythm, how your body is feeling to another level that maybe a coach doesn't completely understand as well because they weren't necessarily in your shoes at this level. And I think that's a very big point that Michael Brockers brings up. I also think it brings an off the field understanding what these guys are going through. The young guys coming into the league, they're getting their first paydays, you know, like it's a lot to go through. It's probably a lot of stress. So they understand that off the field as well. You know, it's more than just simply on the field understanding when to give them the ball and things. It's also off the field understanding what they're going through. He definitely approves of that. And there's really not a lot of teams in the NFL that have done what the Lions have done. I mean, they've taken it to another level of hiring former players. And look, remember, Dan Campbell said it's not a necess you know, it's not necessary that you were a former player. He's just hired a lot of them. Not everybody is former players that are currently working in the coaching staff. I don't think Mark DeLone, you know, was a linebacker in the NFL. I may be wrong on that one. So don't, don't, you know, I might be a little wrong on that one. But my point is, is that that wasn't necessary to get hired here, but it is something that Dan Campbell did bring a lot of. But I think the biggest part he brought up was the communication. And this is huge. All right. This, I mean, this is just absolutely huge when he talks about the communication. He says a lot of guys don't want to be yelled at. They don't want to be screamed at. Just tell us what we got to do and we'll get it done. Just, just as simple as that. All right. That's, and when Dan Campbell says, like, I'm going to treat these guys like men, men. I'm not going to wipe their butt for them. It sounds weird, but I think it's exactly what Michael Brockers is saying here. Look, I'm going to treat you like men. You guys all understand your roles. You all understand your jobs. You all know how to play football. All right. I'm going to talk to you. We're going to work through this. But what, how does it help you, me yelling? Has yelling ever made something better? Has me screaming at you made you play better? Like, how, do, how does that improve? You know, I'd rather you tell me how to fix it and what position to be in than yelling. And that doesn't make anybody better. That just makes you louder. If anything, they're going to drown that out because they're like, dude, this guy is just, he's just freaking out. And that sounds like that was kind of the environment with the last coaching staff, which is a problem. And uh, actually, he brings that up directly. So I guess it's not even it sounds like it. He brings that up directly. He wasn't playing around with this. He said this. You see a lot of that on the team now is a lot of guys coming from that ex ex you know uh patricia era and they're like man this this coaching staff understands this coaching staff talks to you they communicate with you and you see a lot of guys loving that and and buying in and when you have that man i've i've seen that turnaround from uh four and twelve and then going to the playoffs the following year so um Man, I, I just think we're off on the right foot, like I said earlier. And, you know, it, it, it's definitely going to be exciting to, to move forward with this team. He says it straight up. A lot of these guys that were here last season, and there were a lot of players, a lot of these guys, especially young guys, but there's also a couple vets in that mix as well. We're like, hey, man, this is completely different. And I think it's huge for the young guys specifically because, you know, it's, it's a young guy. You're just out there yelling at us. not how they need to learn. Those guys need to be told, hey, put me in this position. This is where we got to put you. They know you have talent, but they got to really build your confidence up. When the line hired the staff they said look the first thing we knew Aaron Glenn said hey we got to get their confidence back yelling at someone that's not going to get their confidence back okay yelling at someone because they did something wrong that ain't going to get their confidence back you got to put them in a spot to be successful build that confidence up have them make a play right so I think that's the biggest thing they're treating them like men now you know they're not like little kids we got to yell at these kids and put them in spots like no they all understand how to play football. They're here for a reason. Communicate with them. And that was the biggest thing that he brought it up is like, hey, this staff will actually talk to you, right? And that's a problem. That's not a good thing when people are, when that's being said by one of the vets on the team about other players saying that. However, 
This is then what he goes into. He said, look, I was a part of this. We went from 4-12 and 12 to the playoffs. I, he was directly a part of this with the LA Rams. This last clip, he's going to talk about the Lions fan base and, you know, really just how loyal we are as a fan base. And there's no denying that. If you're a Lions fan and, uh, you know, you've been through it, like, look, I ain't that old. Some of y'all are extremely loyal. Actually, everybody here is super loyal. But especially people that are older than me because you guys have been through it. Like, you remember that 0-16 season really well. You guys remember the bad. And you've had the moments. But, man, like, we've been through a lot. And I, I mean, I've already seen some whack stuff already, right? So if you're a Lions fan, first off, you're already extremely loyal, right? You're one of the best fans out there. That's just a fact. Fan base always is. You know, win or lose, the guys, the people stick around. People buy tickets. People go to games. They want to see their team. All right, we talk about them all, all season because, you know, they, we are behind them. I know, like, for me, personally, like, right, we get a new quarterback. I've never seen another quarterback start, but I'm Jared Goff's my dude now. Like, going forward, Jared Goff's my guy. Yes, I'm going to get a golf jersey. I just haven't got one yet. But Goff's my guy going forward, right? And I'm going to have that dude's back. Same thing with Dan Campbell. But I think the biggest thing that you take away from this, and he kind of just, like, he kind of just put it in there, but he did it so subtle that you can't really realize it. It didn't really make headlines, all right? But he said this, all right? He said, won't take long to turn around. Did you catch that when he said that? And for the long run, long run and, uh, it's not going to take long for us to, you know, turn this thing around, but it, it's definitely good to uh, know that, you know, that the fan base is always behind you no matter what. He said, but it won't take long to turn it around. All right. These fans are in for the long haul, but it won't take that long to turn it around. So, oh, snap, that could be a headline. Like, you know, someone's using that as a title. I might use that as a title. OK, because I'm just saying he just kind of slipped it in there and I feel like it was easy to be missed. But I think what Michael Brockers touched on here is. Very important. The fact that, first off, he brought up directly that ex-Patricia era players said this, that's that's very important. But also that he's getting those same vibes because this is a guy that directly went through that. He understands. If you guys want some optimism for today, there it is. But let's dive a little bit deeper because, you know, we can't just end it like that. We, we can't just end it like that. You already know I overdid it a little bit. So we're going to take a look at how the Rams turn it around and compare it a little bit to maybe what the Lions are doing going forward and how the Lions can turn this thing around. I think it's interesting when you take a look at some of the similarities as to where the Lions are now to where the Rams were in that 2016-2017 offseason heading into that 2017 season and how people viewed that team. People were sleeping on the Rams and it, not completely to the same level I think they are with the Lions because for the Rams, you know, th they had a little bit of a lighter schedule and the division wasn't great now if Rodgers is in this division it's completely open but the division wasn't great it was really Seattle top and that was kind of it and they didn't have the toughest schedule going forward the Lions have a pretty tough schedule but in just in terms of how they built their team and turned it around in a year I think there are some similarities so as you guys can see here at the very top both rosters rank 31st before the season now PFF puts these rankings out and people get really worried about these I mean, they're cool to look at. Everybody has their own rankings. I can make my own ranking list. Say, hey, the, the Lions have the sixth best roster. All right. Does that make it right? Not really. But it's, it's kind of the same thing, right? So they ranked them at 31. They ranked the Rams at 31 back in 2017 before the year. They ranked our roster at 31 before the year. And that's why I said that receiver video. Look, their rankings are cool, but don't take them too seriously because it doesn't really matter. They do a preseason ranking, then at the end of the year, they rank it again. They change it. So it's not like they're even expecting them to stay the same because most time they don't stay the same. But both of our rosters were getting a ton of love. Actually, their biggest concern was the offensive line. Good thing for us, our offensive line is not our concern, which is a really tough place to have a concern. The only thing they really are going for them in terms of PFF was that, uh, hey, they had Aaron Donald. And that, that's that's a pretty good thing to have going for you. By the way, he played better uh, when this new team came in. But but anyways, my point is, both rosters weren't getting tons of love, kind of like the Lions are now. Ours is more in the receiver position, which we did that receiver video. So if you're so worried about the receiver spot, don't be as worried. It's not great, but you shouldn't be as concerned as maybe you are. I, I don't think it's as bad. And I actually think the Lions are doing the right thing with the way they're approaching this receiver. Unit. Instead of locking up a whole bunch of long-term deals and not knowing 100% sure Goff is their quarterback going forward, it makes sense to give a lot of shorter term deals that way. Hey, if it's not, we don't have, you know, these guys that we're basically stuck with under contract and aren't built for whoever this new quarterback would be. As you guys can see as well, little confidence in golf. Not a lot of people believed in golf. It's kind of the same thing that's going on now. Okay. Look at where golf is ranking. There's not a lot of belief in golf. They looked at the roster. They didn't believe in it. They didn't like the offensive line. They didn't have proven weapons. There wasn't a lot of confidence around Jared Goff. And plus, he was just coming off season where he was bad. Now, Jared Goff wasn't that bad in 2020, uh, but he was bad in 2016 as a rookie. And that's understandable. It wasn't a great look. It wasn't a lot of confidence around Jared Goff. And honestly, the fact that there could be less confidence around Goff heading into this season is pretty insane. Goff is just coming off a clearly better season in 2020 than what he was in 2016 as a rookie. But either way, wasn't a lot of confidence. I actually think first impression 
impression. Someone said this really well. He said, hey, it's first impressions. Goff's first impression was 0-7, so that's how people viewed him. And unfortunately, that can stick with guys unless you really break out. And Goff broke out instantly, so that kind of went away from him, but now people will start to bring it back. However, that stuck with some guys. I think Prashad Perriman's a great example. It's kind of stuck with him. Oh, this guy drops everything. And everybody just stinks. As soon as they hear Perriman, he fast, but he can't catch. But that's just not the case anymore. That hasn't been the case since Baltimore. But still, it's what he's viewed as. That was his first impression into the league as that guy that can't stay healthy. He's fast, but he can't catch the ball. And unfortunately, hopefully, Kuda doesn't have the same thing as I'm really opening bounce backs. And in the words of Aaron Glenn, we got to get the confidence back in these guys right away. We got to get the confidence back in guys like Jeff Okuda. The third pick in the draft, expectations were high, but he wasn't healthy all season. The defense was awful. There was no pass rush. He wasn't even supposed to be a starter right away, but he was because we weren't healthy as a secondary. There was no offseason. He had just thrown into the fire. Yes, it was a rough season. He showed flashes, but it was rough. He didn't show that he could tackle, but I hope the same thing doesn't happen for Jeff. I need Jeff Okuda to bounce back, have some big plays to kind of just get that ugly taste out of his mouth, right? Just to build that confidence up because once confidence is gone, if you are an athlete, you realize that that's the worst thing to lose because you know there's talent there, all right? Regardless of how good you think he is, once you lose confidence, though, it's over. It's, it's a wrap once you lose confidence. So hopefully that doesn't be the case. Also, both coaches were ranked near the bottom heading into that season. It makes sense. Neither of them were coaches before, so that's kind of why. But, you know, it's kind of what happened. As you see, at the bottom left the draft. That was a very big part. They brought in a lot of immediate impact players. You can see they draft a lot of weapons early. I know what people are saying. Oh, my gosh, look how many weapons they brought in. That's because that's what they needed, though. The Lions have a better tight end than ever. We have a pro boy, right? They needed those receivers. It kind of tells you the situation they were in, the fact that Cooper Cup became their leading receiver. They had to go sign a guy like Robert Woods, even though he wasn't great in the past. So I think, again, we did the receiving video. I actually like the Lions situation heading into the year before you know what actually happens that more than what the Rams had in 2016 heading into 2017 as long as we can stay healthy because I think we have more proven commodities and I think we've seen guys play at a higher level but but we'll see Jared Goff was able to make it work with these guys though because in the next year they would address even more go get Brandon Cooks to make it even better and that's something the Lions can do next season Goff plays well this year you know he's your quarterback next year you can invest even heavier at that position with guys that fit how he plays and invest even more money you couldn't do that if you want but the first year is you, know, you want to really see what you got same players improved it's something that's been kind of a trademark of what the Lions have brought in. If you have a positional coach that improves players when they're with you, you know you're doing something right. And that's what we've seen uh, with a lot of our guys, Todd Walsh to Anthony Lynn to Deuce Daly. But you also see it here as well. This team as a whole did that. Our guy Michael Brockers took a huge step forward once this new team you know, came together. Aaron Donald, Peterson was a cornerback. Webster was a cornerback. Roby Coleman who was a cornerback. LaMarcus Joyner, they pushed him from cornerback to safety. And he's like, oh, thank goodness. And he was one of the best safeties in football. Westbrooks, who was a nose tackle, had one of his best years. So it's kind of what happened there as well. And that's supposed to happen. Your team plays better. Players should be getting better. I don't know how you're winning then if it's not. And then at the right, it's kind of just an overview on just what happened. And we're going to dive into it a little bit deeper. But offensive line improved. The run game returned. And their offensive minds were there. See, look, Jeff Fisher, he needed an offensive mind. And this is where I credit the Lions the most. I credit their staff so much for what Dan Campbell has put together. But when you take a look at what they had going on in 2016, and it's really no wonder the offense was ranked last in the league. First off, they had no offensive minds with experience. I think their only guy with experience on the offensive side in terms of coaching had one year under his belt. That's it. That's a recipe for disaster. Okay, look, they lost their offensive coordinator to Georgia in 2015. And Jeff Fisher needed a new offensive mind, right? He needed a guy to run that offense. And it's what Dan Campbell went through this offseason. Campbell doesn't have a background as OC, doesn't have backgrounds DC. He needs to get guys that know what they're doing on the defensive side and the offensive side, let them run it. He doesn't need to be defensive mind. We had a defensive mind in Patricia, and the defense was awful. Now, good thing for McVay, it did work. So credit for him, it worked. But what McVay did well is he went out and hired a defensive coordinator that knew what he was doing, and he let them run that side of the ball. All right? And that's why the defense also improved. He went out and got Wade Phillips. Proven. Tons of years of experience. He's done really good things as his first year as DC. He turns things around. He makes things better. And it worked for them. It was a great fit early for Wade Phillips. Not the youngest guy, but it worked. And that's what... Sean McVay did, and it's what the Lions have done this offseason. Offensively and defensively, you can see the issue with the LA Rams, they didn't have that. Multiple guys turned it down from Kyle Shanahan to Greg Roman. They turned down the opportunity to work with that, to be the, to run that offense. And because of that, they went from their quarterback coach holding the job who got fired to ultimately their tight end coach was their offensive mind in 2016. And that's a big problem. And they went 4-12, they had the worst offense in the league, and flat out Jeff Fisher was, they were like, hey, what's wrong with this team? He's like, 
offense. I mean, it's we can all see it. The offense is terrible. Well, yeah, that's a problem. You got to have somebody that knows what they're doing. And that's what the Lions have done. In the words of Todd Gurley, it looked like a middle school offense. That ain't good. McVay did it when he hired Phillips, but he did it deeper than that. Like the Lions have. He hired a lot of guys and a lot of positional groups that have done really good jobs. And it helped. They kept the running back coach around because Todd really wanted him. Like we kept around Hank Fraley, our offense lineman. We wanted him here. The Lions this season hiring Anthony Lynn. Done it. Had success. Has a background as a head coach like Wade Phillips. He'll run the offense. Awesome. Okay. That's something that, you know, Dan Campbell doesn't have to try to go out there and do plays because he's never done it. Defensively, who's going to run the defense? Yes, Aaron Glenn is a new defense coordinator. You're right. But... It's not like they just said, hey, Aaron Glenn, run the defense. You got it. First time, you got it. They said, let's give you a little bit of help. All right, let's give you Dom Capers, who runs the same defense. You have the same background. Let's give you Dom Capers to help you out this season. It's your first year. Let's give you some help. And then we'll hire your defensive line coach, Todd Walsh, who's been a defensive coordinator, understands how to do it. And he can run the defense. You know the defensive line is locked when you have a guy like Todd Walsh there. He just, he just does his thing. He's done it everywhere he's been. Front office, Brad Holmes. Hey, it's my first year GM. Let me go hire John Dorsey. I understand what I don't know. Understanding what they don't know. Smartest people understand what they're not great at. They understand, hey, I don't, I, Dan Campbell, look, I, I can't run this off. I got to go get someone that can do it. That's Anthony Lynn. Great. Okay. Don't just hire a buddy because I'll try it. You know, I'll see how it goes. No. You understand that's not your specialty, so I'll get a guy that does a great job with it, and I'll manage the team. I'll work on that. You guys handle your thing, and we'll figure it out together. You know, I'll get involved, but I'm not running the offense. Front office, right on my first time. I know what I some of the things, but I've never been a GM before. Let me get someone that's done it and John Dorsey and just have him be there to bounce ideas off of. If I need something, I can talk to him, right? That's what they did, knowing what they don't know. We've talked about it. Jared Goff needs a run game. It's not that he needs the best receivers. We've seen him in 2017, that year. The receiving group was not great. There was a lot of inexperience there, a lot of, I don't know what I'm going to get. And yet, Goff was fantastic. And a lot of those players had their career seasons with Jared Goff. They played great. And that's why, again, check out the receiver video if you're questioning what I'm saying right now, because I'm telling you, it's worth the watch if you're at all worried about the receiver groups. I don't want to dive into it. But the run game. They return a running back coach. We went out, we hired Deuce Daly and Anthony Lynn. You really couldn't have a better tandem of two coaches that know how to run the football. Deuce Daly, running back coach, survived multiple regimes. I mean, he wanted to step up and be the offensive guy. He wanted to be the office coordinator. He said, yeah, you can do that, but you can't call plays. So he didn't take the job. So he asked out of his contract, chose the lines over other teams, and now he's a running back coach. A guy that's done it at a high level for multiple years and also has been a running back. Anthony Lynn, he is one of the most well-known run game offensive minds in football. So you got the guys that can now run it, all right? You have guys that understand what they're doing. And that's kind of what the LA Rams did as well. Biggest thing here, they improved their offensive line. Their offensive line in 2016 after the year by PFL was ranked 27th. That's the problem. That's not good. You can't run the ball when your offensive line is terrible. The next year, they invest in the offensive line. Good thing for the Lions, they don't need to do that, but they did. Sign Whitworth. Older, sent, older left tackle, big move there because they had Cam Robinson who was not doing good. Uh, also, Saffold was still there, Sullivan. They brought in the center. Brown is his first time becoming a starter right guard. He did well, and Havenstein did well. So they brought in some pieces. They addressed the offensive line spot with some vets, guys that they knew what they would get. See, that's the thing. The draft, guys take time to develop. And the Lions are luckily in not that position where they had to do that because for the Lions, offensive line takes years to develop. For the Lions, they already have it locked. They didn't have to even address it, but they brought in Sewell. But keeping Prosper means you have that vet that understands if things go kind of wrong with Sewell early. I don't expect them to because he was such a high pick. But when you're talking about a team like the Rams who didn't have a first-round pick, you couldn't go get rookies and trust them to step in right away. You knew it needed to be better right now, and that's what they addressed. Lions, luckily, already have a top offensive line. As you guys can see, it was ranked 13th last season. Before the season, they're ranking it at 10th. It could easily finish top five. Would not shock me because now you have a guy in Penny Sewell. But even last year, we were proving Proven that the Lions could block the run game and the importance because once the run game was there for Jared Goff, he took off. That's what he needed. In 2016, that run game was irrelevant. We'll get into that. But what you can see is that the Detroit Lions, through the first five weeks season, ranked number one in the NFL in terms of run blocking. But they were only averaging 4.3 yards a carry. How was that happening? Because they didn't have good running backs. Nothing gets Swift. Swift was a good running back, just wasn't getting a lot of reps then really till Jacksonville. But it was the Petersons. It was the carry-ons. They weren't making plays. They weren't making guys miss. I mean, Peterson was a little bit too old. Carry-ons vision was a little questionable. So it was like, okay, Lions this offseason. We got Swift. We know what he can do. He averaged 4.6 a carry as a rookie. That's fantastic. We know what he can do. He'll get more reps. Let's go get Jamal. We know that he understands how to run the football, and he's a good running back. He grayed out. 
I mean, his PFF grade, if we wanted to stick on the PFF hype train, as you can see at the bottom, is higher than what Todd Gurley had in 2017 and DeAndre Swift had last season, okay? The guy can run the football. He's got fantastic vision. Then you draft Jamar, right? You focus on that, and then you bring in the running back coaches. So Lions took that same approach. They hire an offensive line coach like it for us. We have Hank Fraley. Hopping back in here because this part got cut off, but when you think about it, the Rams needed to address the offensive line. So they got vets because, you know, they can help right away, and they could help long-term as well. They had guys develop, like, their right guard. So they hired a new offensive line coach that was proven right it was a big hiring for them so that's where they focused resources so where do the lions feel like they really needed to just invest a position that's been overlooked in the past is to defensive line. The Lions have invested in the secondary in the past, and they continue to do that this offseason. But they've invested there. They just need someone to develop it. It's why they got Aubrey Pleasant. It's why Aaron Glenn's here. They should help. And then you got your vet and Quentin Dunbar. But when you talk about the, the defensive line, I would say like the front five, you could also kind of throw a linebacker into the mix as well. But specifically that defensive line, the Detroit Lions invested here just like the Rams did with their offensive line. We hired a new defensive line coach. That's proven at a high level. Todd Walsh, he'll run that he'll develop hopefully make some of these guys like the Rams did with you know the right guard Brown who hasn't been a starter before all of a sudden play well it took him a few weeks but he took off once the season got going like five weeks in he was incredible after that that's what the Lions are hoping to have happen with Ty Wash and some of these young guys but what the Lions do so they addressed you know, they added talent here. The Lions have overlooked this. They haven't went high on the defensive line in the past. But for this defense, they did. They drafted Ali McNeil. They drafted Levi. Second round, third round. They trade for Michael Brockers. Like the Rams did with Whitworth for that vet left tackle that you knew what you were going to get. It's what they did when they traded for Michael Brockers. We know what we'll get out of Brockers. So we need to get at least one vet here that we know we're going to get. Having Nick Williams, Deshaun Hand, that's good veterans. And then, of course, the edge position. You have guys there can already hold it down. You got Flowers. You got Romeo. You know what you're going to get out out of those guys. Behind that, you have Julian Okwara. Don't completely know what you're going to get, but again, that comes to development with a guy like Todd Wash and kind of Kelvin Shepard, so hopefully that helps. You got young guys like Austin Bryant who's dealt with injuries, so you brought in some more players in the mix. Charles Harris, another young guy, kind of development based here. Reggie Gilbert, you know, from Tennessee and Green Bay. But it was the defensive line, really that front kind of five is where the Detroit line said, hey, we're going to address this. So like the Rams addressed, getting a vet, young players, also a coach, same thing the Lions did just with the defensive line. That's where we address. And for the Rams, they were trying to make their offense go for more so first. That's what they needed to fix. And they did it. If they can do that, the Lions, who had arguably the worst defense in the league, can get to middle of the pack, right? We're not even asking for the best, but to middle of the pack. So they address their heavy, we address defensive line heavy. And that is what everything plays off of. Like the offense, receivers, quarterbacks, running backs, they all play off the offensive line. The offensive line's bad, your offense is going to be bad. Defensively, if your defensive line, that front five, you can't get after the quarterback, you can't stop the run, is bad, everything else can look bad. The secondary needs defensive line. They play off each other. The run defense needs the defensive line. I think what you take away from this is you understand, okay, look, Swift isn't the top running back in the league right now. He was only a rookie, though. Running backs can take some time as well. So we got to give us that time, let him work with our running back coaches, let him improve. He'll get better there. But it was a really good start to average 4.6 yards a carry. That's a lot. That's not easy to do at the next level, right? That's a really tough thing to do. So it was a good rookie, rookie season. But look at Gurley in 2016, right? When he only averaged 1.7 yards before contact, he only had 3.5 on a season. 68% of his yards came after contact in 2016. And that's another very big problem. Elite running backs can make an average offense of line look good because there is a separator in terms of running backs. Swift's not on that elite rushing in terms of rushing the ball running back level right now, but he can get there. He definitely can because what he shows a rookie is he's already really good, all right? We've seen some really good stuff from him, and I think he's going to improve, and I think we saw this year went on. They gave him some more reps. They opened him up a little bit. More reps, more opportunities could lead to even better play. We'll see. Aaron Jones, all right? Aaron Jones ever 5.5 yards of carry last season, but he was only getting 2.5 of that before contact. So three yards of carry were coming after contact. That is fantastic, all right? Aaron Jones is on another level, right? He, he's way up there, and Swift can hopefully get there but Swift is still a really good running back but that shows the offensive line can run the offensive line can block we knew this I made so many videos I was like we know the offensive line can run block gotta get better running back who could take that offensive line and make it even better and as you can see from those offensive line comparisons I mean look the Lions had a better offensive line if you're going by PFF grades in terms of run blocking than the Rams did in 2016 and we know that you need to have a running game if golf is going to be successful and if he's going to find consistency 
consistency. And it looks like Brad Holmes realized that. Brad Holmes like, hey, look, I saw what he did with rookies, unproven receivers, and how successful he was able to be. We don't need to go invest all of our money on receivers. I think that's what you think of. Oh, our quarterback needs to be better. We got to get all these receivers. He's like, look, we got to bring in receivers that fit him. But at the same time, we got to get this run game going because it doesn't matter if he's the quarterback going forward, if John John's the quarterback going forward, if Rocco, I don't know who these people are, if they're the quarterback going forward, they're going to need a run game too, like every quarterback does. So we got to make sure we can run the football. And that's the focus that the Lions put this offseason. If you're going to talk about a spot they focused offensively, it was clear it was a run game through coaches, personnel, draft. I mean, it was it was everything that they addressed was to help that run game. And another thing this affects is those deep shots. A lot of people look at golf as a guy that won't take deep shots, but that's that's not true. When he's had a running game, he will. And he has an offensive line, he will. In 2017, that year, the offensive line took a huge improvement. Third in terms of yards per attempt. 2018, he was even better. He was fourth in terms of yards per attempt at 8.4. And then his final year at Cal, he was averaging well over, I think it was like 8.9 yards per attempt. The guy will take shots. He just needs an old line. And that running game helps a lot, but an old line to give him time to throw it. He went from two point five seconds to throw to 2.9 seconds to throw in 2017. I think Brad Holmes understand this. The Cal offensive line was strong in 2015 when he was pushing the ball down the field, top 10 in the country. And in 2019, that's when it took the step back with LA and his yards per attempt just dropped off a cliff, but he will take shots. I mean, the Lions have deep weapons. And again, he was doing this before Brandon Cooks got there in 2017. It just took it to another level when Cooks got there. So if the Lions believe they have an offensive line, Perriman, Khalif, you know, Tyrell, they can absolutely take top off. This is one of Golf's biggest strengths coming out of the draft. And it's also, there was a time in the NFL where golf was known as having one of the prettiest deep balls in the NFL. That's what they did this offseason, which is which is so exciting. And so that's what the Lions had, and that was a huge turnaround because the Rams went from a team that couldn't run. Gurley was having a great rookie season. Second year was just bad. I mean, just really bad. And all of a sudden, he bounced back, has this great season in 2017. And all of a sudden, the Rams and Jared Goff is playing at an extremely high level, especially for them because they did a lot of play action, so it was even more vital. And, you know, it's going to be a little bit different now because we could see less play action. We could see a little more spread concepts to be able to run the football. You can't run the football. You can't control time possession. You can't control the game. You are in a bad spot. You can't get leads early, and you can't run games out. You're leading. You can't put a game away if you can't run the ball. If you're handing the ball off, and you got a three-point lead, two minutes to go, and you're getting two yards of carry, team's getting the ball back. So you're putting all that pressure right back on your defense. So for a young defense that has changes, you better be able to run the football if you want to close out anything. And we've had issues with that in the past. We've had so many occasions when Stafford was here that trying to close out a game, we're throwing the football. Who does that? We should not be in a third and 11 trying to close out a game because our first two runs went for negative one yards. That's a very big problem. All right, passing on third down is not a problem. Passing it from third and long trying to close the game is a problem. That should not be how you close out a football game. You close out the game because guess what? It's over. It's a wrap. That's the whole point of running out the clock is it should be a wrap. You turn the ball around, he gets three and a half yards of carry, and we're moving the chains, and that's it. That's all you need to get three and a half. They know you're running, but all you need is three and a half. Give me that push. And the Lions could not do that. Some they've lacked for a long time. It is no coincidence that the Lions have struggled. Because remember, Big V needs to stay healthy next season. That can help him even better because this will be his second year playing right guard. He really didn't do this in the past. And also, Jonah Jackson, he was only a rookie. Now, he had his ups, he had his downs in pass protection. But as a run blocker, he was pretty lock solid. And he's a strong dude. So him getting his second year, especially if he's going to stick at left guard. Because last year, he went back and forth early. If he can stick at left guard, not get pushed around because of Big V. Big V pushed him to left guard, basically. But if he can stick at left guard because of Joe Dahl injury, that could help him as well getting that second opportunity to be that position all year work on that all offseason this is my role changing the offensive line a lot is not good because there are different responsibilities it's different footwork it's different technique it, you can do it cross training is important but it is nice to have a guy in a position that you know he knows Defensively was a big change as well the defense wasn't terrible see this is how i view it i think when you look at the lions i think the lions for them their biggest turnaround has to take place on the defense side of the ball. The Rams' biggest turnaround had to take place on the offense side of the ball. I actually think the Lions' offense is really close. I think they, I think Goff is a good enough quarterback to win. We know that. The run game should be there, and they have the weapons to do it. I am not worried about that offense that much, honestly. I'm more worried about the defense, cause, but it's really the secondary. You don't really know what you're going to get with a lot of these guys. Good coaching. Ari Pleasant's done fantastic. Aaron Glenn's done well, but you don't really know what you're going to get. But it's the defense that needs to take that step up. Left side, 2016 versus 2017. The run defense actually got worse in 2017 with Wade Phillips, but he was about getting pressure, and he got after the quarterback. Their pass defense improved because they got after the quarterback like crazy, and really a big factor of that was the offense. 
And that is what the Lions are trying to do. Rams' big factor was this. They played with the lead more than anybody else in the NFL in 2016. Think about that. So if you're playing with the lead more than anybody else in football per snap, that means that other teams are going to struggle to run the ball because... They're down. They can't waste the clock. They had a way better defense because teams had to pass. They got behind. They were a turnover-causing defense that had the pass rushers, and they had a secondary that was making plays because, guess what? Aubrey Pleasant brought him up. He made him way better. And good thing we have Aubrey Pleasant. You know what? I view the Lions as like the Avengers. I, I think we got the Avengers, right? You need that guy to go out there. Oh, I'm going to – we're going to put together this defense line. We're going to get after the quarterback. Oh, Todd Walsh, here you are. Todd Walsh is an Avenger. You know, oh, Aubrey Pleasant, oh, Aaron Glenn. Like, I feel like that's what the Lions are. You know, they're all like superheroes in terms of coaches that all do their own thing well and it's like you're just pairing them all together and you got the Avengers okay you can have your own movie Todd Walsh had his own movie in Saxonville you know we've seen Anthony Lynn have his own movie with Buffalo in LA but now you come together unite okay now we're just like one big force you know we're like the fantastic whatever how many coaches we have that's what I feel like the Lions have here and I can just throw some examples in here like turnover wise okay pressure you have nobody better when you talk about pressure if you want to get pressure you have the two best guys you got Dom Capers who brought the zone blitz out of nowhere and it was like oh gosh what is this and you got Todd Walsh who built Saxonville. What could you ask for? What, what could you ask for? Watch our Todd Walsh video if you want to know what Todd Walsh has done. We also have a Dom Capers video. But you could see statistically, what else could you ask for, okay? The guy has made guys better. And when he's had talent, he's the top of the league in terms of getting after the quarterback. Then the back end. Now, the back end is where there's questions. But honestly, Aubrey Pleasant, we're going to do a video on soon, has probably done maybe more with less in terms of what was expected. Aaron Glenn, look at how the interceptions improved as a defensive backs coach when he was there. Look at Aubrey Pleasant. He was the cornerback coach for the Rams in 2017 and 2020. Look at the interceptions. It went from one in 2016 before he got there to eight, to 10, to seven, to eight, all right? Impressive. The Lions last season only forced 12 turnovers. That's a problem. You got to turn the ball over. Whoever wins the turnover battle usually wins the game. We know this, right? For them, they were able to jump out early. They control the game with a the run. They got turnovers early. They had the most first quarter turnovers forced in football, eight, all right? So they could jump up early, control the game. Goff plays really well when he's ahead. I mean, he's one of the better quarterbacks in the league when he's ahead. Really, co really safe with the football. Only had seven interceptions that season. And then the run game. You couldn't stop the run. You need to stop it, but you just couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, and it made them lethal, okay? They're built like the Packers. Packers are a team that's built to play with lead. You get behind the Packers, it's a tough game because guess what? They're going to get after you, and they got the secondary. The run defense is a little bit like this, okay? we You know, it wasn't great. So you can run early, but if you turn it over, if you fall behind because of some flags, now you're in a tough spot. It's exactly what happened to the Lions last season. They fell behind, a couple of mistakes, all of a sudden you're down 10 points, and you're pretty much done because – it's hard to play from behind for a stat team because it's hard to pass. It's pretty much exactly what the Rams had going on here. Just kind of example. We're going to do a video on Aubrey Pleasant so I can really show you how well he's done. Because when I dove into this, I was like, wow, he's done some fantastic things. He's worked with some really good players and got so much out of these guys. It's impressive. But they went from that 4-3 defense with a lot of the same players to a 3-4. That's what the Lions have done this offseason. They went kept a lot of the same guys you can see at the bottom right a lot of guys but look how he improved Michael Brockers improves West Westbrooks comes out of nowhere he's the top nose tackle Aaron Donald improved Robert Quinn went to outside linebacker he improved Alec Ogletree Mark Barron their, their tackles went down but that's because you're in a different defense you're in one Gabby defense which usually is meant for the defense lineman to have more stats but either way they held down the middle and you had Matt Longrace who had probably one of his best seasons of his career playing outside linebacker there he didn't even play in every game and then of course the secondary look Tremaine Johnson. Tremaine Johnson was the same guy that was there before Aubrey Pleasant got there. But when Aubrey Pleasant got there, his interceptions went up, his pass deflections went up, and his run defense got better. Some of that has to do because the turnovers they were forced, because the pressure they were able to get, also playing with the lead, and Aubrey Pleasant. It all has to tie together. That's why, that's why the coaches say, hey, look, it's not just secondary makes passers better and passers make secondary better. It's that they have to tie together. Found Webster. He's never even started before. He was the top corner for them. He had a pick. He had seven pass defended. But it was his first time being a starter, okay? So it's not like they had all all this money invested in corner so it's like yes they're going to improve they had to rely on the, the getting after the quarterback to help the secondary and already pleasant developing them and he did it quick he's done it very quick cornerback Roby Coleman had one of the best years of his career playing slot one of the best slots but he was already good before that but really why they signed Roby Coleman was to move this is a big one LaMarcus Joyner from playing that slot linebacker role to the free safety to play the deep safety now they were a deep safety set early with Aubrey Pleasant because Jordan did he became one of the best 
free safeties, deep safeties in football that season. Fantastic. Kevin Peterson, this was his first year playing football in the NFL. He had two picks and six passes defended in six games. He was incredible. He hasn't done anything like that since that time. Remember, John Johnson was a third round pick just like T-Walk. Remember, Will Harris was a third round pick just like John Johnson. Like, the Lions have talent here. You literally had the third pick in the draft a cornerback. Don't tell me there ain't talent here. You're, both your safeties were third-round picks. You have a third pick in the draft in Okuda. You have Amani who's already proven things. You have a guy in Dunbar who was the second-best corner in 2019. You got a slot corner in Elder who played the best corner on his team in 2000 and last season with Carolina, but you also have Ford who's competing for that. You got Ify who was a third-round pick. You got talent. You've invested. So now bring in coaches that can get it out of them, okay? The Lions have – we've went through so many players for so many years, but what have we lacked – a great coaching staff. What if we let a great positional coach? When we've had great coaches at their own positions, things went great. Our defensive line coach, things went great. But why can't we get a whole bunch of great coaches and just let them do their thing? Stop getting coordinated and saying, this is my position. I'm going to run this unit. You can do your own thing. Our defense is better when we have an offensive-minded coach. That our offense is better when we have a defensive-minded coach. Why is that a thing? Because they just stay out of it. They say, hey, you go do your thing. I'm going to stay out. I'm going to focus on my side. But that side does better because the head coach has a lot of responsibilities. It can work. McVay made it work. But he was smart. He went out and got Wade Phillips, and it helped him. But at the same time, it's a lot of responsibility, especially for a first-time head coach. So if you're not getting a guy with tons of experience that has done it before, it's a tough ass to say, hey, be our coordinator and our head coach. They get locked in on that. Everything else falls apart. And the only thing that works well is the side that you hired a really good coordinator because you knew you couldn't necessarily do it on your own, and you hired that guy to let it go. Patricia hired DCs. No one that really has done anything. He just hired buddies to help work with him. That's the issue. When we had Caldwell, Caldwell was an offensive-minded guy, but our defense was really good. Works. He was a defensive-minded coach. Our offense was the best, though. We had a good OC. He ran the offense, and defensively, that's where Schwartz was like, "This is my little baby. We're gonna run. I'm gonna run my defense." But. It was the offense that took the cake, even though he built a strong defense because it's reinvested. That's the thing. The Lions have had that so many times. This is why it's so, I love the fact that they brought in a guy that doesn't need to be a coordinator. We don't need a coordinator. All right? You don't need to have coach O's offense. Get guys that can. If, if Dan Campbell came in here and hired a whole bunch of guys that have never done offense or the defense before, and it was like, hey, these are all my buddies. Let's do this. Oh, we're in trouble. Oh, we in for a long Because that's exactly what happened to Jeff Fisher. And he didn't want it to, but it's what happened in Bell Park. But Dan Campbell said, now, look, I don't know everything. Let me get guys that know what they know and they can run it and I'll manage the team. Surround yourself with people that can help you know what you don't know and things will go well. All right. So that's uh, kind of similarity. So can the Lions turn this around? Yes, they can turn this around. All right. Roster is just one part of the equation. They could turn it around. I'm not saying they'll do it and make the playoffs. But they can. Michael Brock is on to something. And don't forget, golf has been a part of turnarounds everywhere with Cal from 1-11 to 8-5 for the first time in 10 years with the Rams. And now it's time to do it with the Lions. If you watch this part, you're a legend. Comment pineapple. All right, just just do it. Remember your thoughts, comments below. Thank you for watching. And I'm out.